Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Here we're looking at roughly a 1986 Zenith 10-inch portable color TV. Uh, the uh, model sticker and information has been obliterated from us, so I don't know exactly which one it was, but these were made uh, in a variety of colors. I believe there was uh, red, blue, pink, white, yellow, black, and maybe like a dark brown color. Anyway, this was shipped in uh, some time ago by a viewer of the channel. It's just now getting to the top of my list. And the complaint is, is an intermittent uh, excessive brightness problem. Now, I haven't confirmed this really yet. I do see we have some massive AFT problems, though. Look at that. Oh. There we go. Now we're getting kind of funky. Almost like it's not, uh, yeah, there's the herringbone pattern there. So it's not tuning itself correctly. The AFT circuits are wrong. Yeah, so even on fixed mode, it's not coming in correctly. We also have quite a bit of distortion here. Also, a lack of contrast overall. It's just stuff isn't really right here. Also, it looks kind of dim overall. We crank stuff up here. Yeah, that's maximum brightness there, so that's not good either. And maximum contrast, eh, doesn't really do much. So, this definitely has some issues. Now, we also see a lot of smearing. To the right here, so definitely power supply issues are going on. Let's crack it open. The only drawback to these is that they're kind of crammed inside. <clears throat> but that's pretty much true of all the little tiny portables. Not sure to the extent that he wants this fixed. We'll have to find out. And I think these are for, I could be mistaken, but I think these are just for the bottom panel here. Yeah, alright. That really doesn't change on. I suppose it helps if I actually take the panel out that's holding the antenna and stuff in. I believe you have to disconnect the speaker. And it does do that. And the cover comes off. And there it is. Pretty densely populated here. Nice and jam-packed, nice little, nice little toaster oven. I'm sure all the critical stuff's going to get charred. I can see down there a lot of board discoloration. Not the best way to start your day, but whatever. Check the board soldering here. Not the greatest, but it's hanging in there. There's a couple of loose connections here for the CRT. That's kind of important. Didn't really confirm his intermittent brightness problem, but I'm sure those caps down there are baked. And that one over there, that's kind of hiding underneath the wires. That's probably a B-filter that's baked. Let's spin it around here. This one back here for the power supply. This one here that's sitting next to the giant power resistors is probably cooked. This uses those mini potentiometers, which just love to go open. And you got your digital tuner pack there. So, let's see here. There's no real fun way to work on this one. 
So the two screws at the bottom release the bottom part of the TV that the board's mounted to, but there's still no service panel that allows you to get to the board, so you have to release the board from this bottom panel, which really kind of sucks. So essentially you have to undo all the screws that are holding the board to this panel, and then pull this panel away, and then you've got access to the bottom side of the board, which is what we need. So pretty much everywhere you see one of these giant screws here holding the, the board in, we need to undo those. These ones here too, all these perimeter ones, they just need to get loosed. And once we get the board loose from the bottom panel, then we can start troubleshooting and checking cap values and stuff. This tube has a very long neck, just notice that. Alright, so we got the board loose. You also have to pull all the knobs off because the knobs as they are will constrain the board from coming out. So we got a nice loose board here. Not much wiggle room here because of all the stuff in the way. I took the CRT cap loose just because I had to get to one of the screws down here. Let's see if we can separate the bottom from the uh, rest of the set and pull it away from the board. The tuners might be the only thing that's going to be our constraint, but yeah, that's that's a little bit of suckage there. All right, we almost got it. We got the board separated, but I need to pull the rest of this out. And I'm trying to separate the chassis from the rest because the tuner doesn't need to be hooked up to anything. But as you can see, there's a lot of constraints here. Uh, yoke and the tuner still needs to be disconnected. But yeah, this is why I don't like servicing these either. These aren't very fun, but uh, you have to get the board out in order to troubleshoot the components. And then you can't really do any live troubleshooting while it's on, so you gotta, you know, look for the obvious and hope and pray that you found what you need to find before you put it back together. Alright, so after undoing all the uh, tuner connections and the grounds, there's our main board. So, he says, dropping it on the floor, uh, let me get this free and then we'll check it out. Alright, so here it is. Free from the set in a way. And we're just going to grab our ESR meter and start checking caps and uh, sections of the power supply and such and see if we come across anything that's obviously dead or near dead. Uh, the main filter could be at fault too. Don't really know. So what I'm going to try to do, since this really doesn't prop up easily, I'm just going to put it on its side here. Maybe put a little bit of a brace underneath it so that you can at least see the meter deflect and we'll start going to town on these things that one's still there obviously and we'll come up underneath here And then, let's see, there was this buried one back here. It's looking a little sad. Not sure what he is yet, because I can't really see. But if it's like a 4.7 or something like that, then 250, that's probably going to be a good reading. And these ones that are reading good... <coughs> May, may have good ESR, but they're not necessarily good. Uh, that's one thing. Like this 3300 microfarad, I mean, the thing will beep at 100 microfarad. So you really don't know until you actually take it out of circuit and test it what it's going to do. And we have these couple over here, like this one next to the heat sink. That's 100. Pegs the same as the 3300, so it makes you wonder, huh? And we got this over here, which is a thousand. And you can't really do any live troubleshooting because there's no room for it. Like that test's pretty piss poor. But again, can't freaking see what it is because it's just buried in there. That looks like a hundred at 25. So that one tests pretty poorly. 
Is that our problem? Mm, very likely not, unless it happens to be helping regulate the tuner power supply. But right now, what I see on the screen is a number of different things. Most of which suggest is all related to one thing, like a power supply fault. Another 100 at 25 that tests subpar. Like these are testing what like 47s would test. Is that going to kill the circuit? Probably not. But it's important to note. Again, but these all these 100s test about the same value. So they're all aging kind of the same. And then we come over here by where the giant 3300 was. And you got all these little caps in this regulator circuit. That one's obviously dead. That one's near dead. So power supply regulation definitely needs some help. And we could have issues with this regulator breaking loose here. Because this soldering is garbage. And these solder bits here are all breaking apart. This connector is starting to break free. That was for the yoke. So that's important. Did that cause our problem? Don't know. Is it likely? Mm, small probability, but yes. That ground solder there is busted for sure. These couple here aren't, aren't great. Yeah, the area where the caps tested bad were down here right next to this TO220 device. This is all baked here on the opposite side of the board. There's a couple more caps back here we need to check. And like I said, a lot of these, you'll never know. You'll never know until you actually pull it out and check it. Like, that one's okay. I don't think that's a cap. I think that's part of a connector I took out. But uh, the, the curious one would be these crucial ones in the power supply here. Make sure that they're okay. And obviously the main electrolytic too, which this guy right here is like I said, this thing will trigger a beep noise at 100 microfarad. And if it says 470, but it's not 470 anymore, that's going to provide inadequate filtering and provide problems with regulation and such. But see, that registers the same as the uh, 100 microfarad 35 volt over at the edge here. This 100 to 35 here registers exactly the same. So you can't really use that as a judgment basis for if it's good or not. You just know that it isn't open. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is disconnect some of these suspicious caps and <clears throat> actually stick them on a meter and see what the meter tells us their current value is. Because I have my suspicions especially in that regulator circuit where things have gotten really hot here. And that's one of those areas where if you don't pay attention to it, it'll bite you. And somebody mentioned the other day about using a solder gun. And those are really nice, but I do like my bulb and my wick where needed. I'm going to take this one completely loose. And we'll check it outside of the machine. Because he provides all the filtering for the low voltage circuits. Like the tuner. And if the tuner voltage isn't regulated, it's going to drift off channel and produce all that garbage we saw on the screen. So let's... Pull this out. This chassis is just so crammed. This is a 3300 at 25 volts. Let's see what uh, my capacitance meter tells me it is. See if I prop it up like this, and yeah, I guess you guys can still see that.
Let's see what it actually reads. That's interesting. Come on. Might have to get out the actual LCR meter because it ain't doing squat right now. So 2,900 microfarads out of 3,300. It's a little tired. Might be a good idea to change it. It's a common value. I have it. And then let's go back to our main filter. And take one of the leads loose on this. I like the, how it's uh, just zip tied in here. That's factory, by the way. No mechanical connection there other than the solder. So if the solder breaks down, that's coming loose. Made in Mexico. This is the downfall, beginning of the downfall. Let's see, this is a 470 still. 435. Again, tired, but that ain't really going to kill it. Certainly not going to cause the symptoms that we're seeing. And then there was this one down here, which we need to take take up here. I'm trying to use my spatial memory to figure out where this thing would be. Because it ain't, uh, it should be around here. That connects to the same spot, so maybe it's here. Let's uh, probe it again. Let's see what it really is. Yep, that's a common. Might be these two points here. Let's solder them and find out. These were kind of like the beginning of the throwaway sets because you can't do any live troubleshooting. There's no room to stick any kind of instrumentation in. So you just have to find the obvious and put it back together and pray. Yeah, let me pull this out. Yep, I was correct there. So that's 10 microfarad, 315 volt. That's about what I would expect to read and in fact if we put it back here yeah so that's an okay cap has good ESR nothing wrong with that no sense in changing that there's nothing adjacent around it that's dirty and stuff that needs cleaning out and then fitting it back in there holy moly yeah you got no room to play around it's really kind of a, a terrible thing they've done by making it so inaccessible the average the average person isn't gonna have the patience for this I need to get some more light in there so I can see where the holes are lining up. Come on, here we go. Go back in there. Ugh, what a nightmare. And I gotta quick solder it back in before it falls out. So that wasn't it.
and these ones that tested good over here by the uh, standby filters those are 200 volt are they yeah 200 volt 33 microfarads so they checked out okay uh, and let's revisit this regulator components here like this capacitor that was absolutely open there that's a uh, 100 microfarad at 6.3 volts now that's going to be right for your regulator which is probably the 5 volt regulator there in fact the positive lead of that is a buffer for the uh, contact there yep so that's important and I think we checked that other cap out up here that was still okay so that's definitely going to get taken out because if you ain't got your 5 volts for your tuner you don't have much of anything yeah this is real life working on these things so far I haven't done any editing other than shortcuts to get the machine apart and stuff so uh, I think it was this guy right here There's no test points on the board. It's not like you can say, hey, it's supposed to be 5 volts here, 3.3 volts here, tuner reactor voltage here, blah, blah, blah. They don't have that. So everything is just a wild goose chase trying to figure out what's gone wrong here. Let's pull this out. So that is 100 microfarad, 6.3 volts. And this didn't register at all, really, on the ESR meter. And I don't think it's going to do so here either. Still says it's 100 microfarad. But the ESR meter says no, it isn't. It's got the same ESR as about a 0.47 microfarad. So... Although this may show a value of 100 microfarads on my meter here, it certainly is not capable of doing what it should there. So we need to change that out. <coughs> Just checking to see if there's any more capacitors near heat sources that need to be looked at like there's another one up here I don't know if you can see that where the jacket is shrunk back there I'm not sure what that circuit's for it looks like a sound circuit or something because they got the little audio amplifier there but just a quick check of that cap there still holding on it's got ESR, but who knows what it's supposed to be doing. I'm not sure where that goes. It's one of those awful purple Matsushita things that should probably get sitting right next to this transistor. Uh, hard to tell what that is. Let's pull them out. He'll get changed out. Like I said, right now we're only dealing with the obvious. And if you're wondering, the boards are marked for polarity on this, so you don't have to worry about whether you can install it backwards unless you can't read it, unless you can't see it, in which case you probably shouldn't be picking up tools anyways. Uh, yeah, 10 microfarad. It was reading about the same ESR as a 1. It's pretty well baked there so let me get some values real quick Hear the trash truck go by
you imagine being a, a trash truck driver and you have to listen to that beeping all day? So I'm going to put the new 10 microfarad in here and then we'll get the 100 microfarad back in the regulator circuit. All right. We'll shove our 100 microfarad back in the spot for the regulator here. And then finally we have our giant 33 mic 100 microfarad. Get this in here. Alright. So we got those in place here. Now it's time to solder them up and then take care of a lot of these loose connections. The one thing I don't like about these little tiny portables is they're little easy bake ovens. And they really bake themselves to death. And again, we don't even know if what we're replacing is going to fix it. We just know that those components are of concern and test very poorly. And they are in circuits that, if there is a change enough in the circuit, will cause detrimental operation. That's kind of how you do it if you don't have any hardcore service literature to go by. Take care of that busted connection there. And all these ones here that just need to be resoldered. We're just going to do that. And go ahead and tip over. That's cool. And then the fun part is going to be reassembling this thing. That one was near broken. This one's about broken. So you have got themselves into some trouble in the early 1980s. In fact, I think it might have actually started in the late 70s with the early System 3s. The uh, I don't know what this with 100% certainty, but the the circulating rumor was that the early System 3s had a uh, kind of a fish paper between, wedged between the circuit boards of the stand-up modules that was supposed to be, you know, not flammable. And you had poor soldering on the boards that would cause arcing and the heat generated actually caught those pieces of insulative paper on fire. And then the set would go up in flames, and then that in turn would cause the curtains to go up in flames, or the house had burned down or something. Anyways, there was this huge lawsuit that resulted as a function of these TVs dying, and they settled for an undisclosed amount of money, and then shortly thereafter filed for bankruptcy, at which point uh, LG slash Gold Store took over Zenith was making stuff in Mexico and Thailand or Taiwan before all that happened but these sets that happened after the Gold Star takeover were definitely a couple of grades cheaper than their previous foreign 
cheaper, uh, cheaper foreign import sets. And then in the 90s, you had the problem with the dud CRTs that had bad guns out of the factory that would short and blow up the set. We're almost done resoldering this part of the power supply. There was a couple of things up here, like these connectors look kind of crummy too. Might as well just do them while we got it apart. I might check a few more things and and put it back together and pray that it actually is going to work normally. I doubt it, but this is just kind of an evaluation video to see if it's possible to fix this within reason, and if not, then it isn't. And like I said, because of the way this set's designed, traditional troubleshooting methods are not possible. So you just have to look at what's obviously dead, replace it, and see if that fixes it. And if so, great. If not, then you get frustrated trying to figure it out, throw it up against the wall, bash it with a hammer and whatnot. Although I might discourage that since this isn't something I actually own. And you move on with your life. This is just one of those things that's been lingering at the top of the list of things to do. So I figured, well, let's go ahead and just do it. Get it out the way. Make sure all these hot leads and grounds and anything that's around a heat source gets resoldered. Anything that looks questionable at this point is getting resoldered. One of these days I'm going to get to something interesting. Like there is a KLH model. 20 system that needs some help that needs to be heavily serviced so we'll get to that all right Taking a quick look around, make sure I didn't miss anything obvious. There's still this neck board with a couple of back connections on it, so let's take care of that. That driver transistor busted loose. All right, so for the most part, things that had to be resoldered were resoldered. Now I'm just going to look over briefly and see if there's anything else that stands out that could be important. Right now I don't see anything though. It's 
So I guess what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to put this. Yeah. Hang on. There's one more power supply part that I haven't checked yet that I kind of wanted to check. And that was this uh, big thousand microfarad here. And I think I'll just undo one lead. Because, of course, the ESR was good. And I actually kind of have to undo two leads because we're going to get in the mix of other components here. If this one checks out okay, then I think we'll clear the power supply. So let's see what this one measures. It had a decent ESR. Still a little tired. 60 microfarad off. It's not really going to affect the circuit as much. I can change it while I'm in here, but I don't think it's really going to change anything else. We checked all these guys. They were okay. This guy up here was okay. So, I think realistically... You can just go back in here. You're not leaking or anything. And we'll just solder them back into place. Then we'll put the uh, install the main board again. And I'm not gonna put you through the hassle of having to watch that. And we'll fire it up and see if we've done anything at all. To help fix our issue uh, but if it's a serious issue like a uh, just notice these couple flyback connections here like a tuner control module failure or something like that then I ain't gonna be able to troubleshoot that they just don't have the ability or the means yeah those ones look a little sad too different angles of light reveal different uh, breakages Interesting how that works. Always need a good visual inspection. All right. So that's that for now. Let me put it back in the uh, set and we'll check it out. All right. So everything's back together. Let's see how we did. There's no sound because the speaker ain't hooked up. But you can see we still have our garbage here so there's some issues going on with the tuner let me try a different channel just to be sure and even on another channel it's just as terrible Now there's AFT circuits that we can try adjusting, but I don't think that that's going to change anything really. Oh, well, maybe it will. All right. Let's now we have at least a steady herring horn. We still have these weird artifacts going on around here. I 
that's clearing up. That's making it worse. Interesting. Now it's not a loose connection so much as it is probably a uh, adjustment back here. And then we've got this AFT circuit here. We can definitely improve that some. All right. So that's a little better. I feel kind of goofy now that I know that it was just tuner circuits not grabbing. Let's go back off and back on the channel again. All right, so that's looking a lot better. Let's turn this off. Yeah, not a loose connection thing. Uh, <coughs> AFT circuits, definitely. Let's go back to uh, channel 4 here. Let me switch my box. Yeah, let's see if it'll grab channel 4. It does. Interesting how it uh, loses phase lock there for a second. Crazy, huh? Yeah, pan switch doesn't really change anything there. It's got a little bit of a tinted picture. Just a little bit. That's your sharpness. So, yeah, was the, the caps and stuff I found the cause of the problem? Obviously not. We got some sort of twitchy McTwitch face thing going on here. And I'm just going down the service adjustments here for the AGC. There's our vertical height. And ignore the letter box. But I can't shift over to something else like this because... Uh, then I can get a copyright strike, so that's not a good thing. Especially with uh, kids' shows. Holy crap. Yeah, let's readjust the height so we can get the full sweep here. Centering's a lot off, that's for sure. But I'm pretty sure we don't have a centering control in here anywhere and there's a two more adjustments back here that's your RF AGC adjust that a little bit So yeah, not a whole lot you can mess with on this thing. Let me uh, plug my signal generator into it, and then we'll do a quick grayscale and focus adjustment, and then I think I'm just going to call this one done, because, yeah, there was a couple parts that were bad, but obviously it didn't affect the problem. It was entirely stuff that was out of adjustment. The a AFC pots were all dirty, and when I rotated them through the range a bunch, and that kind of cleared stuff up, so we'll have to babysit this thing a little bit more. This could be a little tricky because I know the camera white balance is going to try to correct for it. But right now, we have too much red drive and not enough uh, green. Man, that is crusty.
All right, this one uses one of those fixed drive things, which I hate. So in order to achieve a proper white balance, we're going to have to diddle with the uh, screen controls a bit. So we turn the screen down. And we turn the... Turn the green up a little bit. Now we'll adjust our red. And we'll adjust our blue. These turn up both drive and screen. So maybe that'll help a little bit. And we'll refocus. Actually, it's pretty good where it's at. Got a little bit of a green tint to things. Okay, switch the color bars, and we see we've got a little bit of a green tint to the color bars, probably because I had to turn shit way the fuck up. Okay. Yeah, well, the more drive you have, the more there there's our color bars oh those look pretty that's our sharpness that's why it's being so wonky all right got that adjusted right all right let's go back to live tv yeah it looks pretty good decent amount of decent flesh tones Definitely need to kick back on the uh, brightness a little bit. Let's see where our brightness control's at. That's like maxed out. So halfway, halfway shows good results. Still got a little bit of a green tint. back off on that just a smidge okay so this is looking a lot better a little bit of extra saturation there i'll back that off a smidge looking pretty good otherwise okay so I'm going to box this one and just observe it for a while and see if anything else screws up on it. But funny how that works. Sometimes it's just the simple things that you have to check first, like all the service adjustments. In this case, dirty pots were causing the AF3 circuit not to be very happy. But now it locks right in. Touched up the picture. Great looking flesh tones and gray scale. So, yeah. So anyways, hope you enjoy this little adventure. More stuff to come.